Hello, Georgetown. You're watching Spotlight Georgetown. I'm Beverly Enos. You can find us on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. You can find us at other times, too, but that's kind of the standard Spotlight Georgetown airing times. Now, if you want to become part of the Spotlight Georgetown family, you can find us on, um, again, it's the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but you can also come down and learn how to use the equipment. You can borrow it and do some work for your nonprofit. You can um, come down and learn how to edit. They have all kinds of really neat gadgets and gizmos down here and lots of fun stuff. So today we're talking to John Cole, and he is called the Old House Whisperer. And we're going to be learning all kinds of neat stuff about some old houses in Georgetown and also in some other locations. So welcome. Thank you. Nice to have you here. Nice to be here. Now, you don't currently live in Georgetown. You currently no. live in... Rocks Village, Haverhill. In Haverhill. Yeah. But you did live in Georgetown. Yes. Uh -huh. You used to live at 455 North Street. It's actually 554. Oh, 554. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> got, the, got the numbers backwards. Now, there was something neat about that house. Yeah, that had a... Um, it had a couple of summer beams, great timbers mm -hmm. in the ceiling. And um, I had a man come up by the name of Babbitt Lowell Cummings, who's the, still the leading architectural historian in the country. And he came and looked at the house, and I didn't know anything about early houses then. And there was something called a rat tail chamfer stop, which was a chamfering on the corner that came out to a, a point. Okay. So that was very rare and unusual, and he, and he later on wrote a book on timber frame houses in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and he put that information was in his book. Really? From so Georgetown? That, yeah, so that came from Georgetown, which, of course, when the house was built, it was Rowley then. You know, it was before. That's right. But it's still Georgetown. It's still Georgetown. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, Rowley keeps trying to claim a lot of things from Georgetown. That's right. But, but they belong to Georgetown, including Old Nancy. That's really ours. Yeah, definitely things. Georgetown. Okay. How did you get <clears> the name The Old House Whisperer? Uh, actually, my uh, a person who works with me in my office, Peg, Peg Foley, who I spoke and, with today, and, yes, and who now works lady. for Historic New England, by the way. Oh, really? Uh, she just sort of came up with a name. We, we had done a book on her mother's house down in Beverly, and I got to know her, and she just sort of said, "Why don't you try that?" And I said, "Okay." So this kind of came out of the blue, and I, th I, I think it also came from the fact that I've been in you know hundreds and hundreds of historic buildings, and, and. Um, I think when I've, I've gotten to the stage when you look at an early house, it's like looking at a painting, and I don't have to start counting nails or adding window panes. I just look at them. I pretty much can date them by looking at them from the outside. Really? Yeah. So it's an interesting field, and I've been in many cobweb cellars, as they say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can imagine. Now, we have a lot of old houses in Georgetown. Yes. What does it take, or how old <clears throat> does this house have to be for it to be considered an old house, or you, you, we don't call them antique houses, but yeah. a historic house? Well, that's a really good question, because when I started, uh, for instance, I did a project down in Ipswich and on, on preservation covenants, and we drew the line at 1840. In other words, we said then that, that, would, that we wouldn't look at anything that was built after 1840, which is sort of the Greek Revival period. but a lot has changed and really I think anything that's before 1940 really can be considered historic. Um, before 1940. 1940. Yeah, which would include bungalow houses okay. and uh, for example we've, we've... What is a bungalow house? I've, I've heard the term so many times but what is considered a bungalow? Well the, the term really came from, from India originally and they're, they're uh, sort of low roof, great overhang. Okay porches, uh, a lot of uh, gum wood. Um, they're, they're really almost like summer houses. So you see them around New England, okay. but a lot of them have the porches filled in naturally. See, they don't have the open porches. Right, they've been closed in yeah. to make another room. Yeah, okay. and so you have columns, masonry and wooden columns in the front. Um, actually, there's one going down toward Groveland almost to the end of the, of, of the, of the road there. Uh, uh, before you get into Groveland, there's a nice little bungalow up in the trees that, that we've recently done a, done a book on. And uh, so bungalows came along about 1910. Okay. And uh, it's, it's really a craftsman style. That was going to be the very next question. What yeah. is a craftsman house? Well, uh, really Frank Lloyd Wright came along and 
uh, people started looking at building houses rather than uh, just having historic houses or uh, building brick houses. So it was really a craftsman technique. There was a lot of interesting woodwork. And uh, so it's an early term that, that really meant you're putting this house together and it became a craftsman house. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a stick home. It's a, yeah. They actually built it. Oh, yes. Yeah. Themselves. Yeah, they actually okay. built it. Um, and as a matter of fact, Sears, Roebuck, and other companies yeah. had these packages of houses, you know, kits. We have one of those in Georgetown. Yeah, and they would... And they would on Nelson? I could think. be. Mm -hmm. uh, and, they, you know, they, they shipped them all over, and, and they didn't just ship, you know, craftsman houses. They shipped other kinds of early colonial, uh, later colonial houses, and people would put them together, mm -hmm. uh, or Sears would come out and put them together. So, so that's part of the craftsman deal. Because yeah, the um, historical, I don't know, I think it was the Historical Society, they do a house tour every yep. so many years. And there was a craftsman house, and really? I believe it's on Nelson, um, that could be. from Sears. From yeah, yeah. The Sears Roebuck catalog yeah, yeah. was actually purchased from the catalog, yeah. brought here in pieces, and built yeah. right there on site. Yeah. A, a young young couple owns it. Yeah. And there was furniture as well, you know, mm -hmm. they did stick style furniture. Yeah. Went, went in these houses. So, uh, actually, I was originally, believe it or not, I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Really? So, so they have a lot of craftsman houses, bungalow houses there because of the hot weather. Oh, okay. And the porches are all open, and you have a, you have a hall that goes from front to back so they could open the front and back door so that, you know, the air could go through and so on before air conditioning because they were built, you know, in 1915. They didn't have air conditioning yet, so they yeah, a lot of that type of thing in in Charleston, South Carolina, too. Oh, a lot of oh those I'm sure. Of yeah, and California, they're mm -hmm. all over the place. You know, so they were. I'm trying to think what it, they call them down there. They called them something else, but yeah. It was. It was. It's. It's really one of the great American styles. Yeah. And uh, and they're all around here, but you just don't notice them as much because of that closed-in front porch. Right. Yeah. And yeah. we're so used to seeing our, our Cape Cod type style yeah, homes. Yeah, which is quite different. Which are quite different than <clears throat> than all of these others. Now, you do a lot of reports and books yep. on historic houses in the eastern part of Massachusetts. Yeah, that's correct. And, now, and even southern New Hampshire to some degree. Okay. Yeah. So do you write the books or what type yeah, of... Yeah. Well, what you to do these reports or how did you get into this? Well, the owners... Uh, well, of course, I've been at, the, at this work. You know, I was a licensed real estate broker, always specializing in early houses. Okay. But I started at Historic New England many years ago when, by the way, they had a staff of five. Now they have a staff of, like, 50, you know. But, um, so I went around a lot of historic houses then from Maine to Cape Cod and really sat at the foot of the master and learned that way, you know. And um, so, yeah, so um, uh, I've been at it a long time. So would somebody come in and ask you to look at a house and, yeah, and we tell would, them what, was, what yeah, we about would, the house? Or? Yeah, we would, we would get in touch. I would, would architecturally analyze the house, date the house, tell them, what's original and how the house grew, what has been added, and date the house for them. And then also at times, uh, you know, advise them on possible restoration. I mean, there are a lot of uh, times when I think people want to do the right thing, but they don't really know what it is, you know. And uh, we did a project, and so, it, you know, it takes being able to look at a house and tell whether it's uh, first period before 1720 or whether it's Georgian, you know, 1780. Mm -hmm. and, I did a project down in Ipswich a, n a number of years ago in which the local commission uh, got owners to sign agreements uh, not to change interior features without the prior written permission of the local commission. So it had a lot of teeth in it, and that's really a surefire way to save early houses. What we, um, we didn't uh, affect paint colors, or we tried to make it easier for the owners to do it. So. So we got a lot of owners to... Was to, this, uh, was this the Something to Preserve? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and that's been published in a book called Something to uh, Preserve, and um, John Updike was one of the editors of that book. Really? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so he lived in Ipswich, yeah. So in that type of project, you actually get them to agree, not only verbally, but in writing, that yes. they will maintain the character and the originality of Correct. certain parts of the house, not just on the outside, but on the inside, but on the inside. Yeah, and one of the one of the great sort of ironies of the uh, of the historic house business, which I don't think is understood very well, is that usually about eighty percent of the original material is always on the inside, not on the outside. Really? And the, yeah, the reason for that is, I mean, you you can look at a lot of like historic shapes almost, but 
Those yeah. clapboards have been changed, you know, and the okay. roof has been changed. So you're not looking at much that's really original on the outside, yep. which, which is really true. And I mean, it's, it's a lovely shape and it's still historic. Most of the materials on the inside, a lot of people don't, don't realize that. So they think of, I mean, it's nice to have an historic district, but you're not yet saving a lot of that house until you get to the inside. And, they, and that's what, very little has been done about that. I mean, you know, in theory, Georgetown could do that. They could put together a project and, you know, see if they could sign agreements with owners, and that would really protect the interiors. And the exteriors were changed primarily because things like your house needs a new roof, you put a new roof on. Oh, yeah, and clapboards. If the house, if the house yeah. leaks. If yeah. the roof leaks, you put a new yeah. roof. And you know, if when the clapboards are, are rotting, you put oh, new yeah. ones on. So what you're looking at is truly not the original material, uh, except in a brick house. Okay, and, right. uh, bricks don't change that much. When we left Georgetown, we went to an historic brick house over in uh, um, Rocks Village. But uh, we actually, uh, uh, there's a very inter interesting story that relates to a Georgetown man by the name of Albert Meter. And he was, he, was a, he was really a great historian. He lived right, right around the corner here. Yeah, the Meters are a very historical family in Georgia. Yeah, and Albert owned a lot of early documents and deeds. And uh, <clears throat> he, he saw in a catalog a uh, mention of a deed of a, of a house in Haverhill built in 1714. Mm -hmm. And he saw the names of the original owners who he, he knew, no one, they didn't know down in New York. Um, that it was the owners of the house that we live in, and, and we went down and we were able to buy that for 10 bucks, which is really rare. So I owe a lot to Albert, and uh, I, I saw a lot of his material across time. So, so he was really a great collector. And he, yeah. Now, you, there's a house in Georgetown, the Richardson Larkin Morse yeah. house on yeah. East Main Street. Yeah. Now, which house, if you were to describe it on East Main, <clears throat> compared to, let's say, where the bank is? Well, you just go toward straight toward Groveland, okay. and, you, and you go along, and, and there's that uh, kind of retirement trestle way on the right. right. You go a little bit further down, and it's on the left. It's up in some pine trees, and uh, Louise Richardson still kind of um, kind of backs, up in the pine trees. Backs on the lake almost. Yeah, yeah, it's it's up on the knoll, and that's an almost wholly original bungalow house. That's that's really an important house, and that, uh, with the big porch on the front. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Correct, and columns and so on. Yeah. And uh, uh, Louise has, uh, we, we've done a book on that house now. And Louise has done a great deal of the book because she has, she's, has a lot of ancestors of different early families around the area. But so it's kind of a combination of genealogy and uh, uh, period detail. So that's now, a very interesting house. Now, what kind of things are included in the, the books on, on houses like that? Well, we do, like, we'll, we'll take color photographs. Uh, um, analyze the house for its period, say what's original, uh, and then we get into the genealogy and trace the deeds and see who lived there. Okay. Um, and just look at the history of the area and try to write on important people that may have lived there. You know, and we get that out of the out of the deeds. So, and sometimes we can get an early will, and there'll be an intestate inventory, and it'll give you a room by room description of what was in each room. So, really. So we'll so include. what type of furniture was there? Oh yeah. Or carpets. Or? Yeah, yeah, furniture and and uh, china and that kind of thing. So it's unusual, but occasionally you will get an intestate will where they'll walk through the house and they'll they'll go through each room and just and actually m mention and describe everything that's in there. So that's really rare. So so there are a lot of different uh, factors going into writing these books, and uh, but it's a. It's, it's really a lifelong keepsake for anyone that wants to get a book and wants to have a true uh, historic record and genealogical record. Uh, we're really the only people who, well, I say the only, but we, not many uh, groups combine both the architectural knowledge and the genealogy, which is what we do. So that's an unusual combination. And once that's gone, it's gone forever. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, if it's, uh, and, and the more that people learn about their houses, you know, the better they want to treat them, and, uh, and then they have that record, you know, which will stay with them forever. And if they sell the house or they move on, that book is still there, they still have it. So that so, it, it becomes part of history. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've, we've done a number of, we've, I've done houses from Hardwick to Harvard, you know, not, and not just in this area, but, so it's a fascinating work. What do you think has been the most interesting house that you've ever, researched and written about? 
I know, tough question. <laughs> well, no, but well, I would have to say the house I live is in, live in is one of them. Okay, why? Uh, well, because it's, it's uh, Abbott Cummings called it the only fully developed L-shaped brick manor house in New England. So it was built about 1710. The, the uh, bricks were made right, right on the area. You know, usually people say, oh, the bricks came from England. We say, no, that's not true. They were, they were, they were made right in the area. And uh, it, has, it has fireplace that you could walk into, you know, without ducking over. That so, big? Yeah. It has wow. six, six fireplaces, and three of them you could walk into without, without ducking over. So it was just lucky because often houses are saved because they're left alone. Mm -hmm. and somebody with money hasn't come in and put in expensive kitchens and so on. So this house was, was it was a farmhouse for the old Kimball farm over in Rocks Village. And it was left alone for a long time until someone came in and restored it. So um, I'd say that's important. I would say the, that that bungalow that we talked about here in Georgetown is one of the most important buildings that I've seen in the area. And people are going to, as I said in the Ipswich project, we drew the line at 1840. but people are going to start paying more attention and are paying more attention to these later houses. <clears throat> they don't have to be quite that old. No, no, they, they're, you know, later and actually Georgetown has a Greek revival house down going toward the Spalding house, you know, the historical society house. There's a mm -hmm. Greek revival house just right across the street. But those are unusual, I think. Right on the corner of yeah, Elm? Yeah, you're mm -hmm. right there. So that's unusual. So, um, and, and then also Georgetown has some houses on Elm Street that have Rufus Porter mural paintings in them. You know, Rufus Porter was yes. my itinerant painter. Yes. And, uh, and there's a house right on the corner of North Street and Pond Street. Pond, and that house. That has a mural. Yeah, a yeah that has murals too. Absolutely <clears throat> beautiful. Yeah, and I thought the, uh, I actually in my talk, I met the owner there, and uh, I thought, you know, they had a fire in the barn there or something. Yes. Or the sh and I thought they did a really good job of, putting that back the right way. Restoring it so that it, oh, yeah. it, it, it still yeah. preserves the history. Yeah, yeah so that's important. And uh, to uh, once you add on to an early house, one of the things that I do occasionally is consult with people who want to add on or put an L on or mm -hmm. add a kitchen on or something. And there's, <clears throat> there's really a right way to do that and a wrong way. You know, if you, can, if, if you can make the addition look like it's always been there, I mean, that's what you want to do, you know, not have it look like a modern addition. You want to have it look like, I mean, it, it can have a modern kitchen in it, but you want to have it look like <clears throat> that it was always intended to be there on the outside. So that it, it can be, you can be living in the century we're living in, but it should still look like it yes. was built in the century that it started as. Yes. Which is, that's a, a talent yeah. that's very special. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I also did work on, an, on another house in Georgetown. It's the last house on the left as you leave Georgetown going toward uh, Seven Star Corner on Pond Street. Yep. You know, and it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a White House, and it, uh, it, it's about 1805 Federal, but it turns out that there's a much earlier frame in there. It was built about 1720. So I, and I don't see which one it is. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's the last White House on the left-hand side as you go up Pond, and you come there where they have a sort of a hunting preserve or something, and the, and the lake is right there. But oh, I know you go, exactly which house. Yeah, I, I think it's one, is it 188? But anyway, uh, but it's white, big pitch roof house. It's right on the road. Yep. Well, that has a very early L on it, which is really important, which I think a lot of people hadn't realized. Big chamfered frame. So, mm -hmm. And sometimes they would pull, like, frames around. You know, they actually moved houses over the ice with oxen. Yes. So, so they, they move buildings around. So, and that's a really interesting house, and it has that much earlier L on it. So there's a story there to be told. It, now, is that, <coughs> is that the house that's partially brick? Was no, no. No, no it's, no, it's all wooden. It's white. And Pillsbury Street yes. comes in at the very end of Pillsbury. Yep. When, it, when Pillsbury comes in the pond, mm -hmm. the house is right there on the left. Okay. And uh, so you never know what, what treasures you'll find. We have a lot of interesting things going on here in Georgetown. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have a good historic, you know, the Spalding, the early Gamble, that's, that's a really nice house. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Pillsbury Dickinson house, you know, is out of Georgetown. That's a really interesting house. It, yeah. It's been written up. So you've, you've been doing this a long time, and you, you really seem to love what you're doing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I always. It's like a treasure hunt. 
It is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It has been such oh, yeah. a pleasure. Oh, yeah. It's really to nice to meet you. you. Yeah. It's nice to meet you. Pleasure to be here. And maybe we'll have you back again and talk about some of the other homes in Georgetown. Well, I love doing Something it. Something going on. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm Beverly Enos. You've been watching Spotlight Georgetown. Don't forget to join us Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Thank you for joining us. Bye for now.